Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining the Center for Global Asia's talk series on the Belt and Road Initiative. Today, we have with us Dr. Liaquat Ali Shah, who is the head of policy division at the Center of Excellence for China-Pakistan Economic Corridor, COE, CPEC, Pakistan Institute of Development Economics, Ministry of Planning, Development and Reform, Islamabad. Before joining COE CPEC, Dr. Liaquat Ali Shah served as a faculty member at Management Sciences Department of Comsat University at Islamabad campus. He worked at the faculty on different research projects, including the development of a decision framework for economic corridor evaluation using value-focused thinking approach, risk index development for construction projects, benefit management and benefit realization management with focus on special economic zones development under CPEC. And this is, I think, something we will be talking about during our interview with Dr. Liakat. Dr. Liakat has also authored and co-authored several papers which have been published in the International Journal of Production Research, Journal of Manufacturing Intelligence, to name a few. So Dr. Liakat, we're talking, and I think we, you are the best person we could um, speak to about China, Pakistan economic corridor, and I don't think there's any better person for us to interact with. And when we speak of CPEC, I think depending on the country and perhaps even regions um, someone is in, there are various interpretations on what the CPEC is, what the China-Pakistan economic corridor is. So could you briefly explain to our audience as to what China-Pakistan Economic Corridor is? It is a bilateral regional development initiative, which primarily focuses on uh, regional connectivity, trade, and multi-sectoral development. By connectivity, I mean the soft connectivity and hard connectivity. And we have intertwined the soft and hard connectivity in a way, in a meaningful way, to uh, foster economic development along the corridor. So for me, China-Pakistan Economic Corridor is a multi-sectorial development initiative uh, to improve the social uh, being of the people of Pakistan through agriculture modernization, industrialization, science uh, in information technology cooperation and so on and so forth so it's all about a development agenda thank you i like that you said there is a development perspective there's a development agenda and it's also talking about the social well-being of the pakistani people yeah. now dr Liakat, could you also tell us a bit about your role as the head of policy division at the ministry of planning development and reform what what is your role what kind of work do you do uh, we have uh, myriad roles we have played so far in the Ministry of Planning, but I will quote only three uh, roles which are very important, relevant to Center of Excellence. First and foremost is we conduct in-house research and also in collaboration with universities, think tanks, and research institutes in Pakistan, mostly in Pakistan. Uh, our second role is to disseminate or research finding and educate our findings. We engage with stakeholders, particularly with the planning commission to help them support in agenda formulation and also in the decision-making process. So all our research goes into the informed decision-making process. So this is basically our second role. The third role which we play, it's about the true narrative of CPEC because there is a, you know, every now and then there are attacks on CPEC in the international and local media. So our job is to protect CPEC from media onslaught, from media propaganda. So this basically is our third role. So overall uh, research, second is dissemination of that research, and third is the uh, protecting CPEC from uh, propaganda. So protecting CPEC from propaganda, that can't be the easiest of uh, responsibilities. How, how do you manage... How do you manage this, if I ask? Yeah, how do we manage it? I think, uh, you know, we had uh, we have a team and 
sometimes there are questions that people normally, you know, uh, there are some uh, questions that people usually ask in the media. So we being sitting here in the Ministry of Planning, Development, Inspiration, Initiative, with all access to all the documents. So there are misconceptions. So what we do usually, we basically come up with facts and figures and put it there. We have newspaper articles. Uh, more than 56 newspaper articles we have written. We have uh, rebuttals also. I think the rebuttal is the hard thing to do because you have to reply in a day. <laughs> okay, so this is basically how we respond to the propaganda. Yeah. Easy because that's why I started off by saying there is a lot of um, perception, many perceptions and interpretations on what CPEC is. And this is why I wanted you to talk to our audience about what CPEC is, what it really is, because I think. Again, depending on the narratives, like you said, the media narratives, individual researchers, so many people view CPEC in different ways based on perhaps individual agendas as well. Um, Dr. Yerkut, now CPEC we know is an amalgamation of a variety of projects in the energy sector, infrastructure development, and you were also talking about how it connects to the development of the Pakistani society. We also see ports like the Gwadar port also included in this. Can you give us an overview of these projects um, and that are included in CPEC? I know some of them are completed, some of them are ongoing. Could you tell us a little bit about that? Okay, uh, sure. Uh, I will be happy to share with you all the, to give you an overview of the CPEC projects. Uh, but before I come to projects, uh, let me share with you how CPEC is uh, being executed. We started CPEC with one plus four portfolio. Uh, by one, one is basically referring to corridor, but uh, the economic China Pakistan economic corridor, and four basically represent industrial cooperation, energy, transportation, infrastructure, and Gawadar. So we started with one plus four, but CPIC is not a static uh, uh, corridor, it's a dynamic in nature. So we have a long term plan, uh, which we jointly formulated. Uh, from basically the long term plan is for 2017 to 2030. So from time to time, when we need arises, we open up CPEC, uh, you know, uh, uh, we open up new areas for collaboration with the Chinese side. So as of now, we have 11 joint working groups and uh, uh, the four I just mentioned, the other joint working groups include uh, planning, uh, socioeconomic development, uh, security, international coordination and cooperation, science and technology, information technology, so on and so forth. So these are basically the element driver working groups uh, as of now. Then uh, uh, the, uh, the the last one, the information technology and working group was, uh, uh, it was added to the CPEC institution mechanism last year in the uh, 10th JCC. Mm -hmm. Now coming to the projects, uh, in CPEC we have, uh, completed uh, 28 projects at the cost of uh, approximately 19, 19 billion US dollar. Uh, out of these 28 projects, 12 projects, they are in the energy sector. Uh, in the energy sector, uh, the 10 projects, they are in the uh, generation, on the generation side, in one project, uh, basically it is a transmission line project. And one is basically about coal excavation. So these are the 12 projects that we have completed so far. And the total cost of these 12 projects is about $12 billion. So I think out of $19 billion, $12 billion basically uh, been invested in the energy sector. Uh, it has added 6,000 megawatt of electricity. The uh, projects under implementation, there are five. With completion of these five projects, uh, the total uh, generation, basically the, 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 the energy it generate, it would basically be up to 9,000 megawatts, something like that. So overall, if you look at the CPIC portfolio, so the line shares goes to um, uh, energy. Then comes uh, the uh, infrastructure, transport infrastructure. In infrastructure project, we have uh, completed uh, seven projects uh, out of seven projects, uh, and it has added a lot, uh, roughly 800 uh, something, 828 kilometer of roads, mostly highway and motorways to our road network. And other uh, six projects, they are um, uh, road projects, they are under implementation. We have one uh, urban uh, mass transit project, which is Lahore Metro Line project, which was completed in operational now. 
Uh, as far as the Gawadar is concerned, three major projects are going to be in Gawadar. Port is operational. There is a first phase of uh, free zone, which is operational. It's a 58 acre of land, but it's adjacent to the uh, uh, port infrastructure. So it is now available for investment. The second phase, which is a roughly uh, 2100 acre land, uh, it's under construction. So the uh, and then there is a East Bay Express, East Bay Express Railway project, which connects uh, Gwadar Port with a National Highway. It passes through the uh, second phase, basically the phase two of the uh, free zone. Uh, then we have the largest airport, which is under construction, uh, Gwadar International Airport. Then we have uh, the uh, Park Chain of French Hospital project, which is also under construction, will be completed by the end of this year. Uh, so there are so many socio-economic development projects. Uh, some of them we are financed from our own resources. Some basically are pro bono projects from the Chinese side. Uh, some are basically under the $1 billion grant which we have received from the Chinese side. Some of these projects they are uh, implementing uh, from those uh, financial grants. So overall, uh, and uh, very important is uh, the master plan. The Gawadar master plan, it, is, uh, uh, it has been developed. Uh, and uh, it, it uh, has also been approved from federal and provincial governments also. So uh, the CPEC, uh, so the Gawadar is a smart food city, it will be developed as per that master plan, which is basically under implementation. So these are about Gawadar. When it comes to the uh, industrial development, we have uh, identified the uh, nine priority zones in Pakistan. Uh, out of these nine uh, zones, uh, economic zone, four, uh, four economic zone, they are in the advanced stages, uh, which are basically uh, Rashaka economic zone and Khyber Pakhtunkhwa. Then we have Dabiji near Karachi, uh, Alamabad industrial city in Faisalabad, in Bostan and Balochistan. So, so these four private, uh, uh, economic zones, they are in advanced stages, even ready for investment, and even some plots have been allocated also to investors. The other, uh, the remaining five uh, special economic zones, they are in different stages of development. So they will be ready also uh, in the next two to three years. Uh, as for the agriculture, social uh, agriculture, science and technology uh, uh, joint working groups, areas have been identified, but projects, they would basically, uh, different themes and different area within these joint working groups, they have been identified and uh, projects would uh, be started very soon in these joint working groups. So this is all about basically an overview of the CPEC projects. Uh, total, uh, if I um, add all the projects which have been basically included in CPEC, so the total quantum, total amount basically is about 53 billion US dollar. So out of 53 billion dollar, 19 billion dollar, they are, uh, have been completed, roughly 12 billion dollar projects they are under implementation and the remaining they are in the planning stages. 53 billion dollar project so that yes. that can't be uh, taken lightly so that's a lot of money going in for social and economic development yeah that's true um, so dr liakat now you mentioned all of these projects and you also mentioned in certain instances this is how uh, it'll uh, it'll add value to society and you also you also said the lion's share of um, the investment goes into the energy sector how do you think all of this is going to contribute to Pakistan's economic development? Is energy a major um, resource that is required in Pakistan? Could you tell us, tell our audience from around the world about the situation and how uh, CPEC again is going to contribute to economic and social development in Pakistan? Uh, okay, uh, very relevant, important question. Uh, definitely, if uh, 19 billion dollars of investment it has touched the ground and projects have been completed, definitely it will, it will have an impact on Pakistan. Uh, back in 2013, uh, we had uh, serious issues of electricity electricity shortages. Uh, our road network was not uh, at par. So, in the first phase of CPEC, the focus remained on removing economic bottlenecks, which were I just mentioned in the energy and transportation infrastructure uh, domain. So uh, thanks to CPEC, uh, uh, in eight years time, now we have surplus generation capacity in Pakistan. Our total gener generation capacity is about 36, 38,000 megawatt. Our, it's far more, uh, more than our requirement. Then 
as for the road and network is concerned, I think vis-a-vis -vis our economic development state we are, in which we are, the road network is far better now. And the logistic performance index, if you check the logistic performance index over the years, so it has consistently improved. So it's all because of the CPEC projects, uh, especially in infrastructure. So uh, these, in, in, again, uh, I would say that the, the China-Pakistan economic road also created employment in Pakistan. In project phase, uh, roughly 80,000, more than 83,000 83, uh, jobs they were created. Uh, with the colonization of the spatial economic zone, the nine spatial economic zone we are talking about, uh, there is a guesstimate that around 800,000 to 1.2 million jobs would be created within the spatial economic zone. So overall, the impact is huge. There is a study, uh, a bit, uh, a few assumptions, but it says that it would add 2%, basically, it would improve our uh, GDP rate you know, to 2%. So, but I, I, I would say that in future, because the project has been completed very recently, so the overall impact we would see in the years to come. Overall impact to be seen in the years to come with mm. 83,000 jobs to be created. I, that's an enormous uh, yeah. contribution, I believe, to social and economic uh, development mm. in Pakistan. And I think also something that would be required by the people of Pakistan. Yeah, that's true. So do you think, so I think this, this uh, rightly um, situates ourselves to my next question um, about um, CPEC's um, contribution to Pakistan's domestic growth. Um, and you've mentioned, I mean, surely contributing all these jobs would definitely assist Pakistan in its own economic development. But um, Dr. Liakad, one of the other things that we've mentioned that is seen about CPEC is the reference to regional development. We speak about um, CPEC's connectivity to Central Asia, South Asia, um, opening corridors into the Middle East. Could you talk a little bit about uh, CPEC's contribution to regional development? Because you've spoken uh, a lot on the local development. Yeah. Uh, CPEC uh, contribution to domestic and uh, regional development definitely is there. The reason is, uh, I just mentioned about, you know, the uh, removing economic bottlenecks, which were basically infrastructure and uh, energy sector. So with, uh, uh, with, with investment in infrastructure and energy sector, we have created an enabling environment for businesses. So this is basically one aspect the CPEC has covered. The another aspect of CPEC, it has also triggered some reform process in Pakistan because there is a need for reform. In the first phase, it was G2, uh, G2G setting. Uh, we invested heavily in the infrastructure, we invested heavily in the energy sector. Then, but what for? Basically, it was for industrialization. But for industrialization, there are not only, you know, we don't only require the road network and energy, there are so many other things also there and more. So we need an enabling business environment. And that's basically has, uh, with CPEC, with huge investment, which is expected in the industry sector also, it has triggered uh, the reform process. Uh, I will just quote one uh, project, which is PRMI, Pakistan Regulatory Modernization Initiative. Uh, it, was, uh, it has done a wonderful job. Uh, basically, the, the, the objective is to identify regulations uh, which are hindering basically the de industrial development process. So uh, this is another aspect, I would say, that CPEC has triggered in Pakistan. The third, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the role of the China-Pakistan Economic Corridor for the regional development is uh, we connect CPEC now with CARIC. You may have heard about the CARIC. Uh, there are corridor five and six, which comes through Afghanistan, enters in Pakistan through Turkham and another in Chaman border. And it will, uh, one will lead to Gawadar, uh, Gawadar port and the another to uh, Karachi. So basically it's all about integration. It's all about regional connectivity. So what we need now, I, I was talking about hard infrastructure in the beginning and also about, the, sorry, the hard uh, connectivity, soft connectivity. So definitely the hard connectivity is there. Roads are there, railway, road, things like that, they are there. Now what we need is soft connectivity also. Uh, border terminals, we need to improve uh, the facilitation at border terminals. So definitely we will connect uh, uh, CPEC with CARIC, and then the whole region basically will benefit from this integration. So I see uh, you know, prospects 
promising uh, future uh, because of hurricane CPEC for the whole region. So you're talking about connectivity, you're enabling environment, you're yeah. looking at uh, a lot of people-to-people -people connection, soft connectivity. I yeah. think there's a lot of hope and prospect for the CPEC by from what you're talking, telling us. So uh, Dr. Liaka, now these are the positives that we see of the CPEC. What are the challenges that you're facing or some of the obstacles CPEC has faced or is currently facing? Um, in moving forward, in creating all of these connectivity, either regional connectivity, uh, local connectivity, uh, in, in terms of bringing the people, um, Pakistani people, um, regional countries together. Surely a project of this nature cannot be without obstacles. Do you have, are there anything that um, CPEC is facing? Yeah, definitely project development initiative of the magnitude of CPEC will have challenges. In my opinion, the first challenge which I see now in the second phase of CPEC is how to overcome uh, B2B, uh, how to overcome the barriers in the way of B2B languages and people-to-people -people connectivity. So this is basically one of the, uh, there are in G2G setting, uh, even if there arises some issues, uh, we amicably resolve it because we have very strategic relation with China. So in G two G setting, there's, it is uh, it's not a problem, but in business to business and people to people, it will basically the market mechanism that would determine you know how effective or how strong the linkages are. So we need to work on B two B linkages and we need to work on P two P people to people connectivity or uh, exchanges. Uh, another uh, obstacle which I personally see is the perception of security in Pakistan. It's not a uh, security issue, it's a perception of security because we have been through war and terror. So there is a perception that the country will not be secure, but it's not the case. There are businesses, they are running, there are international business in Pakistan, they are there. And even there is a special security apparatus in Pakistan for uh, CPEC projects so, and for the Chinese people. So I think we need to work and we need to manage or tackle the perception of security, uh, I think head on uh, and priority. Uh, another, uh, you know, uh, obstacle which uh, usually in developing countries which they face, uh, it's, uh, you know, the quality of institution which support businesses. But I think that these institutions uh, the quality of the institutions or the rule of law, things like that, they improve with the economic development. So it, the uh, investment basically incentivizes reforms uh, and the reform basically incentivizes investment. So it basically support each other. So I think these are the issues which we are facing and we need to work on that very seriously. Perception of security, I like that. How, how is the Center for Excellence managing this perception for securities? And you, you mentioned at the outset that your institution does work on media narratives. It does, uh, you know, has rebuttals. How do you work on these issues in terms of correcting these perceptions? Is there something the ministry or even the Pakistani government is working? Uh, basically, uh, security directly, it, uh, it is the response. We have a joint working group on security also uh, in the Ministry of Interior. They are looking after all these issues. Uh, we are part of basically their team. Uh, whenever they need, they ask us. So we provide them our input. But overall, uh, to give an impression uh, you know, of the business environment, we uh, in the Center of Excellence have conducted also some case studies. Uh, our people, our uh, research associates, they went to, for example, that area and they did a conducted case studies and they also highlighted how the Chinese people, uh, the Chinese investors, the workers, engineers, how they, uh, you know, interact with the locals, how they contribute in the development of the locals, things like that, you know, through case studies, through uh, some content generation, we give an impression that Pakistan is a safe place uh, to work. And uh, we are trying our level best so the Chinese investor feel at home. Yeah. Uh, 
That's good. That's good. That's what we need to feel at home. That's uh, there's no nothing better than feeling at home in another's country. Dr. Liakot, of all the obstacles and challenges CPEC would have faced, do you also think um, the COVID pandemic would have affected um, the projects, um, the building? Was that something you saw? Because I think world over, we saw the pandemic stopped some of the projects going through construction and implementation of projects. Was that a concern for the CPEC? Uh, I think it's... Uh... Not a concern. Definitely, it has delayed. You know, COVID uh, nineteen. Uh, some of the projects they have been delayed. For example, I will just give an example on the Suki Kinari Harbour project. It should have been uh, completed by now, but because of CPEG, uh, the COD was extended one year. So there are multiple projects. Uh, basically, they missed their deadline because of the COVID nineteen pandemic. But I think one thing which is positive. Uh, it's, you know, the commitment. I think the commitment has not faded uh, on either side. So definitely projects are delayed, but commitment is there. And hopefully all these projects, even in a delay of six months to one year, they will be completed, they will be there. So uh, as for the Center of Excellence collaboration with China, definitely has impacted because we signed MOUs with the Chinese institutes, think tanks, and we couldn't basically work on that because of this COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, hopefully, I, uh, I hope that uh, China will be open by the next year, so we'll start again those activities collaboratively with the Chinese side. Yeah. So it's true, I hope so too. Um, so you said the projects have actually benefited from the slight delay that have been caused, which I think is slightly unusual compared to the other countries because there's been um, a burden on the cost in terms of having people, connectivity, so this is, I think, interesting in terms of CPEG. Dr. Yerkut, I think you mentioned that part of your role at the Center for Excellence for CPEG is also conducting research and disseminating the research. Um, we also see that you're promoting industrialization and trade in Pakistan under CPEG. Can you elaborate on some of the work? Because I think you mentioned about three pillars, research, you're conducting research, you're disseminating it, and the media sphere. So if you could tell us a little bit about the first two prompts. Um, okay, about the research, uh, we have, yeah, we have, multi, we have multiple uh, research works which we have conducted in house. Um, I will, I, I think it's more than uh, over 104 research publication we have done in Center of Excellence for CPEG. Uh, there were 82 uh, research grants which we give to researchers across the country to institutes, practitioners, and uh, you know, academicians also into practitioners also. So one aspect of our center of excellence, which is basically conducting either in-house research or collabor collaborating with other institutes and things, so they are there. So uh, as a whole, you know, if you combine these two, so it's become roughly 200 studies. So we have uh, conducted these studies in-house. Uh, then comes basically, you know, the uh, our involvement. These are research studies and policy paper, but we have also contributed in the policy documents so in the uh, Ministry of Planning, even in the Board of Investment. I will just quote an example. Uh, when the industrial uh, development framework, it was basically which, which is ready for signing with the Chinese side, uh, we from the Center of Excellence contributed to that. Uh, then come, you know, the, uh, for example, uh, page book, which uh, the Prime Minister, uh, you know, uh, Imran Khan, when, when the then Prime Minister, uh, we prepared the page book for him, even for this visit also, we pre uh, prepared another page book uh, for investment in Pakistan. So, and then come the ECG incentives, things like that, and all, each and every document we have contributed because they share with us and we provide them input from our side. So this is, you know, our contribution to the policy documents directly. Uh, then comes, you know, about different studies also. We have uh, worked on uh, different aspects of, uh, you know, sectoral development also. I will just give an example of halal meat in Pakistan. There is a huge potential, but uh, we don't capitalize on that. So we also uh, held a seminar in Karachi, where all the stakeholders, exporters, public officials, and we basically come up with a policy paper so how to enhance basically uh, the uh, meat export from pakistan and now china with 1.4 billion population definitely the requirement for food is huge so i think we need to capitalize on that so this is about you know the sectoral uh, um, uh, development how what we uh, have done so far 
Uh, as for the, uh, you know, uh, relocation, because we have developed China, Pakistan economic corridor, with it, uh, we are being developing it, and there are special economic zones within the corridor uh, framework. So we need a relocation of Chinese industry. This is a huge, basically, one of the obstacles also basically to convince and persuade the Chinese investor to come and invest in Pakistan. So uh, for that, what we have done, we have also looked at the re relocation phenomena. Uh, what basically influenced the you know, firm's decision to relocate from one country to another country. We have also worked on product level and we have identified, identified uh, products which uh, uh, where Pakistan have a competitive advantage. For example, uh, we, uh, you know, it's not about you know, the competitive advantage with regard to one or two country, but we have taken multiple, more than 10 countries we basically have uh, considered in our study. Uh, which are basically contender also for the relocation from the Chinese side. So these, you know, type of studies uh, we have conducted our, in our center of excellence. Then comes, you know, technology transfer mechanism because we hear about technology transfer, technology transfer everywhere and developing country are talking about uh, technology transfer. And let me quote an example of, you know, the, uh, one of the visit of uh, Deng Xiaoping when he visited Japan. And he was basically, uh, uh, when, when he visited a, a steel uh, industry over there, a factory. So he asked the um, owner of the industry basically to provide this technology, uh, technology to China. Uh, the reply was, and uh, you know, the, the investor reply was, uh, the technologies are bread and butter and we earn money with it. So we can't give it that way. So exactly the same way the technology can't come that way. So I personally felt, uh, you know, in different uh, meetings where uh, some of the public officials who have a little bit know how the technology transfer process. So you work on that mechanism also, but uh, you know, how the Chinese basically acquired their technology or other developing country can get it. So we work on that. Then comes the backward and forward linkages, uh, you know, and uh, about the manufacturing issues. So there are a lot of studies, you know, the list is long and extensive. So we have worked on that in our center of excellence. So this clearly shows that the center for excellence has been working hard through the research to create a better understanding of the CPEC project in Pakistan and the world around. And also I think from the examples you cited, Dr. Liaka, you've also created, expanded the opportunities and possibilities for collaboration via the CPEC. Um, so under your role at the Ministry of Planning, Development and Reform, you engage with different stakeholders. I think you also mentioned a few of these examples, especially in the industrial sector, um, to gauge their needs. Can you tell us a little bit about this? What kind of needs do you see coming in from the sector? Um, and I think you also said you try to put them in touch and, um, you know, like the halal example you gave in terms of meat. Um, are you doing, are you uh, putting them in touch with businesses? With what, uh, what kind of work do you do? Uh, yeah, of course, uh, we have, uh, we are definitely in touch with uh, Chamber of Commerce in Pakistan, uh, with Pakistan Business Council, a huge forum for large business in Pakistan. We have very close collaboration. Uh, then uh, we also are in touch with business association in Pakistan. We have more than 120 business associations. So many of them we know and we are in touch. Uh, in the uh, uh, PRMI, I was part of the PRMI, um, not directly, but uh, you know, indirectly I was uh, contributing. I have given trainings, how basically to go about, you know, the streamlining of procedures, thing like that. This is my core area also one of the area. Yeah. So I have worked on process modeling in my PED. So uh, exactly the business process engineering concept can be used also for the streamlining of procedures. So, uh, you know, through these multiple forums, we are in touch with business forums. Uh, associations in chamber of commerce uh, what issues basically definitely regulatory issues they are harder some of the regulation they are there uh, which are basically totally outdated there is no need for requirement but nobody has touched you know uh, since they are there they are there and people are still uh, asking for NOC thing like that even though they are very irrelevant these days so uh, first and foremost you know the requirement of industry is to streamline and make it simple and for that reason, we are also working uh, with a board of investment uh, for developing one stop shop. They are in the developing stage and hopefully it will be alive in, uh, very soon. Uh, then there is a business ma matchmaking because uh, some of the investors, they want to engage with the Chinese side, but they don't know to, you know, to, 
with whom you are, how to engage with. So there is another portal which, which is basically not the center of excellence doing, it's basically the mandate of border investment they are doing, but we are there only whenever they require us, we go in and give our own port. So for business matchmaking, there is a portal which is under development. So these are uh, the, the requirements. So procedural requirement, uh, regulatory burden, things like that, they are uh, definitely there. So uh, they want simple procedures and we are working on that. Uh, another, you know, definitely when there is an industry there uh, in Pakistan, in developing countries, uh, there are all, all these issues of uh, access to, you know, cheap finances. So they are there. Uh, State Bank have come up with a plan. They are now uh, providing loans to SMEs, not for the big business, but SME, they have a separate mechanism they are in place. Uh, so financial constraints, they are there. And I would say another issue is about you know, skilled labor also. Uh, though I don't agree with um, economists, sometimes they say that we don't have a skilled labor, but my personal opinion is we have a huge skilled labor because every year more than I know a million of people, they go into the job market, they have degrees. Uh, if basically they uh, they can be refined, their skill can be refined if they are provided with trainings. So this also responsibility of the businesses. They will not find you know ready-made people to hire and work on you know immediately on the industry. So if we provide proper training to these people, definitely the skill uh, gap they will also be reduced. But I think the incentive you know for these things is when there is a demand for skilled labor, definitely the uh, vocational training centers uh, they will be you know engaged. They are engaged over there. There are some certain programs they are being conducted, but we will do it more extensively if we see that the industry is coming to Pakistan. For sure, skilled labor, unskilled labor, see you're connecting people. That's one of the biggest uh, constraints businesses face in terms of connectivity, in terms of partnership. And I love the term uh, uh, part, uh, matchmaking. Uh, partnerships and matchmaking that I think is an interesting terminology and I hope um, other countries along the BRI would take Pakistan's and I think the Center for Excellence's um, example and create these kind of matchmaking uh, cool. systems for other businesses in their countries. Dr. Leahat, we've had a very fruitful discussion. Is there any final thoughts you would like to leave with our audience regarding the China-Pakistan Economic Corridor? Yeah, of course. Uh, I have, uh, you know, uh, definitely when I think about CPEC, there is uh, uh, huge opportunities uh, for regional development. And uh, undoubtedly, you know, it can basically connect China, not only with Pakistan, but it can connect China with Central Asia and, you know, even to Eastern Europe also. Uh, Central Asia, Eastern Europe, uh, East Africa. So we are strategically located and uh, I think we need to capitalize on the, uh, our location also. Uh, but I think, you know, for the sustainability, I talk about the G2G and P2P because it's very close to my heart. And the second phase of CPIC, why I say P2P is very important. The reason is uh, for the sustain G2G setting, we create an enabling environment, but uh, for the economic viability and sustainability of the corridor, what we need is the people uh, who would basically need to step forward and engage with each other. Businesses to businesses engagement, they need to be enhanced, promoted, and facilitated. Uh, for the P2P, there are barriers we need to work on it. So I think if we improve those linkages, uh, people to people and P2P, so overall the CPEC uh, contribution will be phenomenal. Otherwise, uh, there will be a big question mark on the sustainability of CPEC. And I think the same example can basically be if, if we improve the P2P connectivity uh, and uh, we, we put basically people at the center of our planning. Uh, so I hope that uh, CPEC will uh, uh, contribute to the social well being of the people of Pakistan and for the region and beyond also. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Liakat. You spent quite a lot of time explaining and describing about the CPEC, the work you do, and the, I think the opportunities, most importantly, the opportunities afforded to people, countries, businesses, via the 
China-Pakistan Economic Corridor. We will leave your contact details in case uh, anyone wants to contact you for, you know, make use of these opportunities. I hope that is okay with you. And thank you once again for your time. Thank you. Thank you very much. And hopefully see you soon.